Welcome to Concussion Talk Podcast, presented by Head Check Health. I'm Nick Mercer. This is episode 48, and I'll be talking about the brain today with neuroscientist and director of the Emotional Brain Institute, Joseph Ledoux from New York University. Before formally introducing my guest, I'd like to first thank my sponsor, Head Check Health. Head Check Health bridges the gaps in concussion care through simple, powerful technology. Join organizations like the Canadian Football League, Trek Factory Racing, the Canadian Junior Hockey League, Eastern Washington University, and Volleyball Canada who rely on HeadCheck to improve communication and optimize care. Visit HeadCheckHealth.com for more. My guest today is Joseph Ledoux. Joseph Ledoux is a professor of neuroscience, psychology, psychiatry, and child and adolescent psychiatry at New York University. He is also the director of the Emotional Brain Institute. The Emotional Brain Institute is a joint initiative between New York University and New York State. Okay, I've introduced you earlier in the podcast, but uh, if you'd like to please just introduce yourself and just Hi, who you are. I am Joseph Ledoux. I'm a professor of neuroscience at uh, New York University. And my latest book is The Deep History of Ourselves, The Four Billion Year Story of How We Got Conscious Brains. Uh, that, that was great. I, actually, I heard you on uh, Joe Rogan podcast, and mm-hmm. uh, I thought you'd be a great person to talk, talk about now because you're a neuroscientist, but also a great person to talk about uh, the brain and consciousness because that's, every, as we'll know, that every brain injury is unique, every concussion is unique. So, and you talk about consciousness, obviously, a lot, con- the conscious brain, so, and that's obviously intertwined with how people. How, how people react to, to brain injury and stuff and all that. So, uh, and there's so inter- intertwined with that is also your idea, this idea of auto noetic consciousness, mm-hmm. the recognition of yourself and your own potential, own potential as future. So, if you could just talk about, first of all, talk about your book, A Deep History of Ourselves, the four billion year story of how we got, how we got conscious brains, and what do you mean by consciousness? Okay. <laughs> if well, I agree uh, that within half hour. <laughs> right. So can can I um, maybe the best thing to do is to tell you why I wrote the book as okay, a starting yeah. point, sure. and because consciousness really doesn't come up until the very end of the book because well, it's yeah. a long story and you know right. it's, I think it's something that happened recently rather than uh, in the in the far past but it's built you know it's something that that emerged out of this four billion year history. But anyway, so I got started on this topic because um, I'd worked on this brain area called the amygdala for, I don't know, 35, 40 years, something like that, uh, maybe 35, I don't know. Started in 1985. Yeah. And, um, well, you know, the, the amygdala is involved in detecting and responding to danger. And we often talk about that in terms of fear. But, you know, I've really been pushing the idea that it's the amygdala is not despite common understanding, is not a fear center. It's a system in the brain that detects and responds to danger. The conscious experience of fear is something that comes about later. So just put that thought on hold. The consciousness is separate from what the amygdala does. The conscious fear itself is separate from what the amygdala does. The amygdala is detecting and responding to danger. So I worked on this and found um, how the amygdala receives inputs about danger and how it controls outputs to make you freeze or flee or to make your blood pressure and heart rate go up, or stress hormones to be released. So I worked out all that kind of circuitry. And the next question was, you know, how do, what kind of molecules are involved in the learning of that kind of stuff? And um, we got clues about what to look for from the work of Eric Kandel and others that were studying simple organisms, invertebrates like snails and flies and so forth. And with a simple nervous system, it's pretty easy to figure out what the cells are doing and how the molecules are contributing to what it's doing, but it's much more complicated in a mammal. So with all those clues that they discovered in invertebrates, we simply applied those to vertebrates, to mammals. And indeed, the molecules that underlie the learning about danger in a rat and a human are the same as those that underlie learning about danger in a fly or a worm or a, a snail and so forth. So how did that happen? That means that there's some ancestor, common ancestor, that gave those molecules, those genes to, to each of those lines of organisms. 
those organisms are separated by 630 million years of, of evolution. Um, but where did they get theirs? Well, you know, the invertebrates got theirs from other invertebrates. But, you know, by, there's, a, there, are two, there are three kinds of invertebrates. One is the, um, the uh, bilateral invertebrates. You know, they have a front and a back and a top and a bottom and a left and a right, just like we do. Yeah. So they and we get those genes from an ancestor, which was the ancestor, the common bilateral ancestor of invertebrates and vertebrates. So where did that that early invertebrate bilateral organism get its genes and molecules? Well, it got it from a jellyfish-like organism that has uh, a, a top and a bottom, but not a front and a back or a left and a right. And where did it get it, its uh, genes and molecules? It got them from a sponge-like organism. And where did it get its? So now we're talking about things happening close to a billion years ago. And it, the, the sponges got their genes and molecules from a protozoa. That's a single cell organism. Now, what is a single cell organism doing with genes and molecules involved in synaptic plasticity in an organism with a nervous system? Well, protozoa learn and store information as well. Uh, they can avoid danger and learn about what's dangerous and move away from it. They can learn about what's useful, like food, and move towards it. Um, but they don't have a nervous system. They're just a single cell. Now, that's kind of phenomenal that they can learn, they can store information, but they have no nervous system because we think of a nervous system. It's important for things like learning and memory. But they do it. And in fact, you know, they get this stuff from bacteria, the oldest living organism on Earth. Yeah. Going, that takes us back to 3.8 billion years ago, um, the beginning of life. So what does that mean? If we think about what a bacterial cell does in life, it has to do five things. Detect danger, incorporate nutrients, balance fluids and ions, thermoregulate and reproduce. Those are the same things we have to do to get by. Yeah. And other animals as well. So when we think about rats and mice and, I don't know, snakes or whatever, and we talk about the behavior, when they're eating, we think they're eating because they're hungry. When they're running away from danger, we think it's because they're afraid. But that is the wrong conclusion. So that's the, your idea, sorry, sorry to drop, that's your idea of the implicit and, uh, and conscious memories? Oh, that's implicit. Uh, we're not talking yeah. about consciousness yet. I just no, want to get yeah. The, the, yeah. the history of this implicit memory thing, because yes, it's so right. implicit, there's no consciousness to even make it explicit. I mean, if we're going back to the beginning of life, four billion years ago, yeah. where we've got cells that can store information about danger, acquire new information, and respond to it, all without a nervous system. So that four billion year history is the history of what takes us to a brain area like the amygdala, which does the same thing. It's detecting and responding to danger. It's identifying useful and harmful foods and so forth. It's involved in, in sexual behavior. But it's not involved in the creation of fear and hunger or pleasure or any of those things we project onto the organisms we see behaving like that. That's the key point. Right. So now you want to know where does consciousness come from? Well, <laughs> that's that's a bit much. But this uh, amygdala, as, as you think, you say the amygdala is responsible for the implicit memories of uh, of, 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 of us as uh, humans is what, I'm, what we're interested in here. The uh, so humans amygdala is what controls that through various yeah, neural inputs. There are lots of different kinds of implicit memory. The amygdala yeah. is involved in implicit memory about danger, but also about foods and sex. And it, uh, it stores a lot of different kinds of implicit memories. But that, you know, it's really inappropriate to talk about the amygdala. I mean, I do it too, but yeah, it's, no, no, so it's a complicated thing. There's like four parts, of like, just, but it's bilateral and it's got well, the 12 different, different nuclei. Well, take it, look at it this way. Let's take one cell in the amygdala. Yeah, it might it might be involved in all of those behaviors involving sex and um, food seeking and uh, uh, danger and so forth. But it could be involved in it um, because it's part of a different circuit. In other words, all the synapses on it are not doing one thing. 
you, you might have that cell involved because some synapses are getting inputs from feeding systems, some from danger systems, some from sexual systems, and its outputs are going to different kinds of responses. So cells are parts of networks and networks are parts of systems. So the amygdala is, is simply, it's like a big building, a warehouse that has all this storage stuff in it. But you store different things in different places. Exactly, yeah. So, I mean, because you, you, as you demonstrated, the amygdala is a small part of the brain, and it's and, the, and, and it is, alone is that complex. It shows you how complex uh, the complexity of the brain. Um, and I'll, I was just going to ask you about the, this. Uh, I sent you, I don't know if I sent you, I tweeted uh, a, a study by uh, Melanie, Dr. Melanie Wegener, W E G E N E R, Wegener, Wegener, Wegener. Uh, yeah, we've been communicating but, a long time working this out. I don't remember. Yeah, remind no, me. no, no, that was just last week or whatever. <laughs> I yeah. just tweeted it. Um, she, uh, this, this is about this is about brain gen concussions, and uh, actually, what brought me to think about you were you were mentioning your before in the, the Joe Rogan interview, the split brain patients, the epilepsy patients you studied in in this in the in your PhD. When you're first studying, first what well, first studying graduates are interested in conscious memories and, uh, yeah. and emotions, and the split the split brain, split brain epilepsy patients you were studying then, and how she did a very similar study, well not very similar, but a, a study about concussed patients showing them flashing words on sides of a screen, so left and right, okay. and the, mm-hmm. the so the it crosses and she they determined. I could, they thought they could determine that they, that the uh, a concussed patient had their corpus callosum or the splint or their splenium uh, inj- injured, so they disrupted the flow of, of the flow of information okay. from left to right. So, do you just let's talk about these pet brain patients. And those are just fascinating examples. So the split brain patients you you studied you first you were introduced to so. Do you want to talk about what, what this study you want me was? to talk about those? Yeah, if you could. Yeah, just okay, put... so, yeah, I was a, I was a fresh graduate student. Uh, didn't have much background in science when I uh, joined the lab of Michael Kazanica in 1974. And I thought I was going to be doing some animal research with him, but he said, no, we got this really cool project on these, these human split brain patients, these are epileptics, in whom the two sides of the brains have been separated in an effort to control the um, uh, sort of the runaway seizures that happen if the if the information is crossing between the two hemispheres uh, unconstrained because they have you know damaged tissue from the epilepsy that's creating a lot of neural activity and it kind of gives it some momentum if it's crossing back and forth but it, these people are fascinating to study from the point of view of consciousness because you can talk to the left hemisphere um, just as you and I are talking, but yeah. the right hemisphere is kind of it's you know it's a silent it's hemisphere. Own. It does yeah. it's on its own. It's over there, kind of. We don't know what's going on over there, but um, we had one patient that um, could read in both hemispheres, but he could only talk out of the left, which is a more traditional right. thing. Right. Um, but because he could read, we could put complex questions over there rather than just you know showing a picture of an apple and he could find the apple. But here we were asking him, "Who are you?" And he would uh, take his left hand, connect it to the right hemisphere, and reach out in front of a, uh, into a, a bunch of Scrabble letters and pull out P A U L, his name, Paul. Good job. Um, and he could also, you know, when we asked him, "What do you want to be when you grow up?" He spelled um, uh, race car driver. Mm-hmm. Now, when we asked the left hemisphere what he wanted to be, it said, "I want to be a, you know, a draftsman, an architect." Yeah, yeah. So we right, because you're different, yeah. Gotcha. You know, these, it, this was pretty striking. Yeah, I mean, yeah. you know, it, is it like hard science you know, with statistics? No, it's just yeah. observations. But it was a very striking observation that one side of the brain had one life ambition and the other side had a different life ambition. But they both had the same name. They both knew his name was Paul. So there's a kind of self-identity. And yet these two sides are kind of you know, off on different t- tracks about who Paul is, in a sense. It's kind of fascinating. So the auto, autonoidic consciousness was was just, is was in both hemispheres or or around yeah, or yeah, yeah. somehow. Well, that, you could, you could you know, that would be uh, a conclusion you could draw. Shall I explain yeah. autonoidic consciousness? Uh, so autonoidic consciousness 
is a term introduced by the psychologist Indel Tolving from um, Toronto, uh, there in Canada. Uh -huh. And he um, he had this idea, well, he, he, he was the first person to introduce the idea of semantic and episodic memory. So these are memories about facts, that would be semantic memories, as opposed to memories about episodes in your life or personal experiences. And um, these these are two kinds of memories that both involve the medial temporal lobe or the hippocampus uh, uh, to s store them and, and retrieve them and so forth. Um, but they are of different qualities in a sense. Now he said, well, the but, but they're both conscious memories, memory that, memories that you can conscious experience. So he gave a name to the conscious experience of semantic memory. He called that noetic. In other words, just oh, like... Knowledge, Greek for just yeah. knowledge, so it's knowledge about something in the world. But autonoetic, he used that for self-referential knowledge, knowledge about oh, okay. yourself. So noetic consciousness is, you know, I know there's an apple there. Autonoetic consciousness is, I know that I know there's an apple there. It's right. me that's seeing the apple. And right. that is, uh, you know, no one has demonstrated that kind of extra level of, of uh, awareness in other animals. It doesn't mean that they don't have it, but it's certainly been, been difficult to kind of uh, to demonstrate that. So, um, it, and it's certainly important in who we are as people that uh, right. we, you know, I, me, mine, all these things that, that we care about are, are ours. You know, that's the basis of all, everything that's good about us, but also everything that's bad. We kind of like can form groups that will ostracize, hate, kill other groups because of uh, beliefs about What's the what's the proper group? Uh, so consciousness is our best friend as a, as a species, but also in a sense our worst enemy. Right, and it, which also means I mean, shows you talks about how complex the the brain is. Because there's not this is an area of not I shouldn't say a new area of study, but I mean the brain is still relatively I mean relatively unknown compared to other uh, the, all the paths paths you go through and all the all the different processes it can it can handle. So um, yeah, there, there's a lot that goes on in the brain. I mean, I think we've yeah. you know we've made a lot of progress. Yeah, the Society right, for yeah. Neuroscience started. This is sort of the the 50th anniversary or so. So it's we've only been studying neuroscience, you know, technically for 50 years. I mean, there've been there were people studying the brain before that, but there was no sort of identification of what a scientist that studies the brain is, and that's what kind right. of brought the field together now that we have, you know, tens and tens of thousands of people uh, studying the brain. And I think we've, we've, learned, we've learned quite a bit, but there's still many mysteries that we have to. Exactly. Yeah. Actually, one of them is, uh, well, these emotions, which obviously is a big part of your studying of the threat detection. But I wanted to ask you more about this Hebbian learning or Hebbian learning. Okay. The, the, Hebbian. Which is, with Hebbian, which I said that, but. Features Another Canadian, by the way. Is he? Huh. Ah. Yeah. Uh, Donald Hebb, yeah. uh, he grew Front up in uh, Nova Scotia oh, and yeah, uh, be became a professor at uh, at McGill uh, and one of the most famous psychologists and neuroscientists ever. Nice, nice. Well, that's good enough. So, uh, but this idea of synaptic of weak signal and strong, so we need a weak signal. Can you explain happen learning better than I will? Okay. My so, notes, but uh, sorry, is that a small follow-up question to that is uh. So is that kind of what happens with, uh, like, I mean, I know a lot of people with brain injuries are server, service members or people have, or even people who've just had a traumatic brain injury like myself, that uh, so traumatic PTSD, is that yeah. associated with having learning? Would, that, would you, would, was well, that let, me, let me back up a little bit yeah. and just explain what it is so your listeners will oh, yeah. be grounded on that because it's exactly. pretty simple. Yeah. Uh, it's a very, it's not just about, I mean, it may happen in PTSD, but let's talk about it in the simplest kind of form. Yeah. So you're walking down the street, um, you're standing, you, you see your neighbor's mailbox, and all of a sudden, the, in the, your neighbor's dog bites you. Yeah. Now, next time you walk down the street, you're going to be Pavlovian conditioned to the side of the mailbox, because that's, that's what you were looking at when the dog bit you. Right. So Pavlovian conditioning, you know, a strong stimulus like a bite is painful is paired with a weak stimulus like the side of the mailbox, and so the mailbox now acquires aversive properties. So Hebb's theory was that the way this happens in the brain is that a, a strong stimulus changes the activity of the neurons that it is connected with. 
So something like a, a painful stimulus goes into a part of the brain like the amygdala and arouses those cells in a very powerful way. And one of the, one of the consequences of that is it triggers protein synthesis in those cells. Now, mm -hmm. protein synthesis is the basis of you know, a lot of what cells do. Now, if at the same time that the proteins have been synthesized and, and active because of the, the pain, if the same cell is getting a weak input about something that happens simultaneously, um, but ordinarily wouldn't do much, it acquires that ability to activate those cells because the proteins basically glue the weak stimulus synapses into the cell oh, yeah. and strengthen those. So now the weak stimulus is able to activate that cell the way the strong stimulus did. And so all you need now is the side of the mailbox to make you freeze and your blood pressure to go up. And, and this stimulus is, doesn't only have to be a visual stimulus. It can be an oral or a, or a feel, to, like any, any sense? To any sense, yeah, yeah. Any sense? Well, no, so, I shouldn't say any because sights, sounds, touches – uh, are very sensitive to, to that kind of learning. But when we get into, then smells as well, but when we get into taste, it's a different thing. Okay. So you, you can have Pavlovian conditioning to a taste uh, that made you sick, despite the fact that there's no overlap. So you have the taste, and then maybe an hour or so later, you get sick, you get nauseous, but your brain connects that taste with the delay but you know with the previous uh, sorry the the uh, connects the nausea with the taste that happened an hour or two ago that was not thought possible in terms of pavlovian conditioning but it now is believed to be a form of pavlovian conditioning that operates very similar but it's just got that long delay so is that is that very similar to uh, it can happen not i'm saying reverse but just in different circumstance for example i i'm close to someone who is well i shouldn't I shouldn't say I don't know who they are, but uh, who has anxiety. So, uh, and notice that whenever they're, whenever they, they, their, 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 their gut, their stomach feels a bit uneasy, they, or not a bit uneasy, but a certain sense they in their stomach, their gut, or, or that, that, mm -hmm. that they have anxiety. So sure. that, is that just your, your emotions or that brain shouldn't give you an evolutionary saying, hey, you have mm -hmm. anxiety now. So they are well, producing this, or so is it because of your, I think it's more more basic than that. It's it's a form of interoceptive inside you, in other words, Pavlovian conditioning, where, for example, panic disorder involves, yeah. for example, a person who feels a, a kind of, you know, twinge in their chest and goes into a panic because they've associated that twinge in their chest with the um, um, uh, idea that that's going to lead to a heart attack. They think they're having a heart attack. So the the mild twinge is uh, a CS, and the idea of the heart attack is really the unconditioned stimulus. In other words, what the shock was in the other example. Oh, so, okay. you know, the, the unconditioned stimulus does not just have to be a biologically significant stimulus. It can be psychologically significant as well. And so the, we have these associations uh, in our lives all the time. Now, you asked about PTSD. PTSD is a condition that uh, involves a lot of different kinds of symptoms. So it's not one thing. And yeah. each kind of symptom has to be understood separately. And there's certainly a lot of Pavlovian conditioning that goes into PTSD where all of the stimuli that are present when something painful or traumatic is, is happening to you, all of those stimuli get conditioned. And they become triggers of panic attacks and other things that will uh, you know, be problematic for him. But PTSD also has more explicit memories involved in the rumination over uh, the trauma and the, you know, all of the um, uh, memories of what was going on during the trauma. So it, the, uh, it, it's all happening in there, but um, there are different kinds of, of uh, stimuli and different kinds of um, uh, uh, learning that are taking place. Right. Uh, actually, well, I know I know you're not a brain injury, brain injury expert. You are an expert, right. expert on the brain. At least you're an expert on the brain. So, the uh, I was going back to the uh, Dr. Melanie Wagner or Wagner. The uh, her 
today on concussions, but mm. uh, this is not about this that study. But uh, concussions, I know, they get on like their level, the result of all the of a flood of neurotransmitters and 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 different uh, different uh, di- different uh, what neurons in the brain mm-hmm. that try to, to to fix, to repair, to retain, get some some sort of homeostasis, get some state homeostasis in the brain. But um, and uh, what was I gonna say? Yeah, so I mean, and and some of that's similar to what we were saying about like, emotion is is uh, your reaction is like a flood of not flood, but like that controlled controlled flood of emotion. So, have you ever has has there been any any communication coordination much much coordination or communication between the emotional brain institute your institute at New York University and the and concussions of, like people are studying concussions or brain training? Well, yeah, so there's a, I think um, probably the closest connection is that people that are doing, for example, uh, studying traumatic brain injury, um, which often is associated with PTSD, will sometimes be working with more basic researchers like myself. And there was a time when I was um, uh, doing some research with uh, Charles Marmer at the New York University Medical School, who is a PTSD psychiatrist, but also has a big program in traumatic brain injury. And we were applying for grants. Unfortunately, we didn't get the grants to pursue that yeah. research. But uh, but yeah, but that that's so this and the concussion the the study of concussions of the I mean, for example, I know for, for me personally, I have a I have double vision in the fat and some brain and some brain injury, and I'm right eye dominant. Mm-hmm. So this disconnection there there I mean that's I know it's just one study now I shouldn't draw any conclusions, but um. How long ago did the, you have your injury? Uh, I had in 2003, so in 16 uh-huh. years, uh, yeah. you know, seven, be seven years in August 1st of this year. So, uh, but um, so so that means there, there's probably some. There's obviously a, a disconnect between my my right my one side my my vision is on the left side, so my right eye down, so my left my left side. My my right vision, my right vision seems fine, like seems perfectly fine. So mm-hmm. there's little little damage to that that particular that visual cortex, but it could be a, a bunch of other things. Could be you can't, I can't I can't just say there's damage to my visual cortex on my on the right side of my brain. I'd say I can say there that could be that's one that could be could possibly be one thing, but there's also right. different matters of connections action, connections between. By atmospheres and in within within atmosphere, so right. is that is that the uh, that is that what you your your thought of the uh, of the uh, you know of sorry uh, not, not John Reiner but of the motion about how different neurons and and your there's, you know, there's a certain level of evenness to your like you want your brain wants to maintain your body wants to maintain on stasis right. and your right. brain wants to have some stasis so is there a is there a is there is there a do is there a belief that there's a or a theory that that uh, these that this that the uh, injuries are, I mean, aside from structural structural imagery, injuries, but that because the brain is very, let's say gelatinous, but it's very right fluid. Um, right. Not very fluid. But, um, is that is that all going to be? Is that do you think it was all it was? It's not solved, but. Uh, states of the like different ions and different uh, neurons, you can get a balance there. That'd be that. That is the uh, that's the goal of the brain to reach, achieve some balance. Well, I wouldn't say it's the role of the brain, but it's a necessary. The, sorry, the goal. Uh, the goal. Of part the of a goal of the brain. Yes. Well, yeah. I think the goal of the brain is to keep you alive, and to yeah. keep your body, help your body um, keep going. I mean, the, you know, from the first cell that ever lived, four billion years, three point eight billion years ago, whenever it was. Um, the way it, you know, th- there were many experiments of cells before that, but finally one kind of cell came along that was able to do more than just survive for a few hours or a few minutes. It was able to sustain itself long enough to reproduce its kind so that that cell could also reproduce its kind. And that was the start of the whole process. You know, every bacterial cell alive today is the daughter of the first bacterial cell that ever divided because 
they just keep dividing and dividing and dividing. So it's kind of fascinating. And you know, so that those cells figured out how to survive. And as a result of that, we use that same process to survive our cells. We have many cells in our body. And so each cell in our body has to survive. But unlike a bacterial cell, we have to make those cells um, coordinate amongst each other. And the fact that all of the genes, every cell in our body has the same genetic uh, makeup allows that coordination to, uh, to take place and to avoid any kind of physiological conflict. So the goal of, of every cell, but also uh, of your whole body, is to keep you alive. And um, part of doing that is having homeostasis. Right. Well, I know, I know you have to, I mean, this, I mean, I, I've kind of jumbled a lot of these questions together, but, uh, I, I know you have to, you have to go now soon, but, um, I just wanted to thank you so much for, for doing this, for doing this podcast. And, uh, I shall, I shall ask you before the end, I'll ask you the question about your, I don't know if it's your theory or, or just general theory about emotions, what are emotions and, oh, sorry, sorry, I'm trying to go in this podcast, but just ask you one final question about emotions yeah. if you can def- explain what, you th- what your theory of emotions emotions are so I, I think of emotions um you know i think we've gotten into a lot of trouble by using mental state words to talk about non-mental state aspects of the brain so when we talk about the brains for example the amygdala in terms of fear what we're doing is putting mental states into the amygdala which i don't think is the case so for me, an emotion is the experience, the subjective experience, that autonoetic awareness of you being in a biologically or psychologically significant situation. And for that to happen, there has to be a you, somebody has to be home in order to answer that door, in, in other words. So yeah. uh, that, that's pretty simple, simply what it is for me. It's that, that conscious experience. And all of those other things that we've inherited from from other creatures all the way back to bacteria is um, just stuff that helps modulate that process. You know, for example, when norepinephrine and other molecules are released in the brain in a, a psychologically or biologically significant situation, their job is to prolong that state to keep you locked in psychologically so that you can focus on that state and and deal with it Uh, so they add intensity and they add duration but they don't define the experience the experience is defined by the uh, the, your mental state of being uh, aware of what's happening to you so i mean you know not not everyone agrees with me on this definition but i've tried to simplify emotion by restricting it to the the experiential part and talking about other things which have a much longer evolutionary history without bringing in conscious experience into their operation. Okay, well, well I, 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 I mean, thank you so much again. Now, this is the final thank you. thing. Thank you so much. And uh, I thank you again for also following my looped. And uh, we, I don't know, well, logic is gone. My logic is fine, but my... My thought process, my train of thought was kind of all sorts of loops and crazy switchbacks and all that. So uh, thank you for somehow keeping well, thank up you. with and that. I, you know, I, and, I wish uh, you well and uh, all your listeners well. So thank you for and, having and, me. And where, I'm, well, sorry, well, where can uh, where can anyone interested in your book about the about the, the deep history of ourselves? Well, so if you look up my name, last name is it's L-E-D-O-U-X, capital D, no space. Uh, if you look it up on Amazon or any of the other book places, you'll come across uh, the book. Uh, there's also a, a website for the book called deep-history-of-ourselves. So deep history of ourselves with dashes between each words dot com. Um, and I have a, my own website, which you can get to everything to uh, from there as well. It's joseph com. So, um, again, thank you very much for having me, and I, I hope uh, all the best for you over the holidays. Thank you, you too. And uh, thank you so much for being on. And, and boss, please visit his website, his uh, joseph com. is his, which is actually in your, and his, his band, the Amygdaloids, and his solo projects, are, they're, all, they're all there. So uh, I encourage everyone to visit that, and also uh, please visit my website, www.concussiontalk.com. And uh, 
thank you again, Joseph Adu, for being on the podcast and uh, helping thank to you. explain the, the the brain, like and what the brain actually does, other than just than you know be injured or not be injured. <laughs> so uh, thank you. All right, thank you. Bye bye. Thank you all for listening, and thank you to Joseph Ledu again for following my twisted thought process. Concussion Talk Podcast will be back again in January. As always, music at the beginning of this podcast is by Ben Sound, www.bensound.com.